Next up, an experiment to measure peer pressure. How much is the individual influenced by the group? Seeing as Arnold Rimmer's late, the subject of this experiment can be him. When he finally does us the honor of turning up, I shall ask you a set of questions and want you to answer accordingly. First of all, I'm late. So embarrassing. He'll kill me. Ah, Mr. Rimmer. I hope we haven't inconvenienced you too much by starting on time. Sorry, Father. I'm Father outside college. Inside college, I'm Sir or Lecturer Rimmer. Understand? Yes, Father. I mean, Sir. So embarrassing. We're just about to run through a few questions as part of Psi profiling. OK, take a look at this colour. Is it purple, blue or green? Hands up, purple. Hands up, blue. Green. <laughs> a fallopian tube is a musical instrument. True or false? True. <laughs> What's the answer to this piece of arithmetic? Hello, uh, Mark Warner, and hello, Red Dwarf Posse. Um, I'm Simon Treves. I played Lecturer Rimmer in um, episode six of uh, Red Dwarf 10, Red Dwarf X. Um, and uh, Mark has very kindly sent me a list of questions. Um, and um, I'm now going to try to answer them, as many as I can anyway. Uh, and forgive me if I uh, I don't know the answers to some of these because uh, I'm, I'm, I, the first time I came across Red Dwarf was um, actually doing it. I mean, not I obviously knew about it, but I'd never really seen it, which could have been very embarrassing. Um, probably was. Anyway, the first question: Tell us who you are and who you played in Red Dwarf. Well, that Simon Treves, lecturer Rimmer, and. Um, what was the last thing you brought and can you show us? I can't show it because the last thing I bought was last night online. I bought the fantastic Russian Hamlet on DVD, uh, 1964 film. And actually it's been on iPlayer recently because of the Shakespeare festivals and stuff. And uh, although it's in Russian, in a translation, uh, by Boris Pasternak, who wrote Dr. Zhivago. It, it, I highly recommend it to anyone who's a bit of a cinephile or um, interested in, I don't know, in, in really good cinema. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastically atmospheric and direct and moody piece. And um, yeah, I think it was filmed in Estonia by the sea. Anyway, that's what I just bought, and uh, uh, so I can't show it to you because it hasn't arrived yet. Um, what was it like being on the set of Red Dwarf? Well, if I'm honest, it was bloody terrifying. Um, part of the reason for that was because, unbeknownst to any of the uh, people involved, uh, my father, who was also an actor, Frederick Treves, um, was literally days away from dying and I'd only just been to see him uh, and I was very under quite a lot of stress at the time um, and it just happened that by the time they'd got to this final episode I, I discovered only by watching the documentary on the um, uh, Red Dwarf uh, 10 DVD extras that um, it had all got a bit uh, stressful and chaotic uh, on the Red Dwarf uh, thing as well. So that everything was being put together very much at the last minute. And um, 
you know, you'd get uh, script changes right up until the moment of shooting almost. Um, so anyway, so the combination of those two factors meant that uh, I sort of was in a sort of heightened panic. <laughs> and on top of that, I was obviously playing a character who is extremely <laughs> austere and uh, rather, rather cruel. Um, so I had to be very controlled. Uh, so especially actually the first scene, which was the last thing I think, the last thing they shot, well, certainly that day, um, and it was shot under quite a lot of pressure. Um, I was in a complete state, if I'm honest, and I, 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 it was right at the end of the day, I'd, I'd, I, was, I remember I was called down to, uh, to do it, uh, and I knew I had 40, we, they had 45 minutes, I think, 50 minutes to get the whole thing in the can with all the different setups and everything. Um, and I just completely froze, and I, I forgot all the lines I'd learnt, um, and a, an assistant director took me to one side because they could see I was looking pretty rough and said, uh, would you, uh, would you like anything? Would you like, and I just wanted to leave, you know, I just, oh, this is not going to happen. Anyway, she took me through the lines. I couldn't remember any of them. Eventually we had to go onto the set. Everyone was there. The lights were all on. The cameras were all there. I think they're doing multiple setups to, to save time. Um, and, uh, dear God, even when I, even when I remember it, I'm thinking, oh God. Um, and, and anyway, the long and the short of it is that there was a, a great, I think he was the first assistant, uh, who saved my life basically, because he could see I was panicking and he said, listen, would you like, um, would you like, uh, the lines to be on boards? And I thought that would be a terrible admission of failure. And I only discovered after we'd done it that actually, uh, I think I was talking to Chris Barry, and this is much, much later. Um, and he said, oh, we all, we all have boards. Well, it might've been Robert Llewellyn. We all have boards. We, we, no, none of us know the lines. So anyway, so that made me feel a little bit better. But um, so a lot of all that scene is, is me actually um, <laughs> checking the line and then saying it. And luckily, Doug Naylor cut out all the kind of rubbish. Um, anyway, so that was that. And then the, 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 the earlier scene I recorded, of course, was the, second, the, the other one, the, the, the hologram. And that's the, fu the, the first and only time I've been in, uh, on a green screen. And uh, again, because of what was going on in my private life, I, I, I was finding it very difficult to keep a lid on things. Uh, and uh, so the whole, th the whole thing, and sadly, the, for me, the whole thing was actually very stressful. Uh, it was no fault of anyone to do with Red Dwarf. It was entirely to do with my own circumstances. And um, I just wish I'd been able to do it uh, maybe at a different time. I think I would have been a bit, you know, more comfortable. But they were lovely there, and 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 all the regulars, the the Red Dwarf regulars. I spoke to them at uh, lunch, the lunchtime, and uh, they were all great. As they were the Dimensions Jump thing, year a year later. Um, do you think Rimmer will change much now he knows you're not his father? <laughs> um, that's almost a question for Doug Naylor, really, isn't it? or um, Chris Barry. Um, I'm sure he will. In fact, even in that episode, he, after his conversation with his father, he suddenly finds this character that uh, is bold and brave and, and uh, explains everything. You know why he is what he is, and 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 in a way that the the, the episode, the series ten, kind of ends with that new Rimmer, who's going to be a, a different character. So I think that's already been answered in a funny way. If you could come back for series eleven or twelve, would you want up Rimmer's dad or someone else's dad, presumably, or someone else? I know they've been filmed. Don't know you went back. Well. The story there is, um, I had a phone call 
uh, just before Christmas. No, did I have a phone call? No, I had an email from uh, from Linda, Doug's uh, partner, wife, who Linda Glover, who's who's uh, the casting director for Red Dwarf, and she said, "Can you make yourself available because they're planning to bring Rimmer's dad, or not dad, back for." either series 11 or 12. So immediately I got the impression that things were as chaotic as they were on the series 10. But um, there was no, you know, no decision to be made, but, but I was asked to keep several dates free. Anyway, then we got into the beginning of the new year and the dates kept shifting, you know, um, back. And sadly, eventually, I got an email saying, I'm really sorry, um, it isn't gonna happen. They've run out of money. <laughs> because I'm so expensive, of course, you know. Um, and uh, so it didn't happen, which, which I, and I, I have no idea what I was going to do or not do. Um, but uh, yes, of course, I'd love to come back in some way to do more Red Dwarf, I, I, you know, not least to, to wipe the slate of the previous experience. But um, I also think there's probably, there's probably more story about, I mean, you know, you could you could even argue that uh, it's a double bluff. You know, Rimmer's dad saying I'm not your father may not be the truth. Who knows? I don't know. Only Doug Naylor knows, and um, I hope I hope he does consider Rimmer's dad uh, coming back, um, or lecturer Rimmer rather. Have I a favourite episode of Red Dwarf? Well, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I'm shamefacedly um, have only seen ep uh, series 10. Um, and so what can I tell you? I actually, I'm biased, aren't I? But I, I, I thought the episode I was in was a cracking episode. Um, and I actually, I remember r laughing out loud um, at the scenes with the oh forgive me uh, what what is it what are the name anyway the, the the alien characters who who are um, around a sort of table and <laughs> uh, on an, on an, uh, they were like sort of the equivalent of the equivalent of the Klingons um, but anyway the, those characters and also my dear friend Richard O'Callaghan uh, Hoagie the Rogie I, I have to say I thought he was brilliant as Hoagie the Rogie. I kill your, what's it, I kill you, I kill your father, I kill you, or something. Anyway, he made me roar with laughter. And when his wig was flapping in the wind, um, that, that made me roar. So, yeah, I, I think uh, episode six of series ten has to be my favourite. I'm, 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 I can't think why I might say that, but anyway, that's what. And also, can I also put in a word for... Howard Goodall's music, because um, Howard Goodall is a great composer, and I've known his work for a long time, you know, in the musical theatre, and the, and his theme for Red Dwarf, really, it, as soon as you hear it, it sort of goes, it makes you want to go, yes, you know, this is going to be good. Um, how would you treat Rimmer if he was your child? Well, I think I've already done that. Um, I treat him with complete contempt. Um, he's an idiot, obviously. Uh, and um, he's very lucky to have reached the age he has, given his obviously innate stupidity. Uh, will you be going to any convention again like Dimension Jump? I hope so. Uh, I, w I did go to, the, to the, fir the first one after the series was recorded and had a great time. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was unlike anything I've ever done. Um, and, uh, and also it was very nice to have a chance to talk to people like Chris Barry and Robert Llewellyn and others, John Lenehan, you know, in a more relaxed way about things um, and about Red Dwarf and their experiences of 
doing so many series. Um, and the only person I haven't really spoken to, and it's bizarre to say this, but the, uh, the, the pressure of time was so great. I hardly feel I know Doug Naylor. Um, I mean, of course he directed uh, that episode and he directed my scenes, but I think he was under such pressure that um, I never really got to talk to him. I mean, I remember him sort of being exasperated that I couldn't seem to get through the scene without drying. Um, so it would be nice to have met him, but maybe maybe there'll be a, a, another chance. Who is your favorite cast member? Apart from myself, obviously. Um, well, as I said, I, I know Richard O'Callaghan. Uh, I've worked with Richard on several things and he's always lovely. Uh, so it was great to, to, I didn't actually work with him on, on the day with him, but um, he was there at the Dimensions Jump. Um, and then I got to talk to, as I say, I got to talk to particularly to uh, Chris Barry and uh, uh, Robert and also um, Hattie Hayridge, John Lenahan. Um, so that was nice. I don't have a favorite member, obviously. I don't have a favorite cast member. I never met Craig Charles. I did briefly meet um, Danny John Jules. But, uh, you know, there. What was it like working with a young Rimmer? Well, he was great, wasn't he? Um, I mean, not only a good actor, but he was also, uh, um, he looked so like Chris Barry. I mean, that was very clever casting. Um, and he did his little bit at the beginning of that episode so well. Um, he sort of got that, you know, that thing that Chris Barry does with his nose. Um, wrinkling his nose. He seemed to get that off. I don't know whether he was, he'd been studying Chris Barry in previous series and episodes, but he was great. How did you get the role and did you have to keep it secret? Um, I got the role actually mainly through Richard O'Callaghan because Richard rang me and said, um, I th I, I, it's, it's a long time ago now, but, uh, he rang me and said, listen, uh, uh, I've done, how would you feel about doing blah, 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 you know, if, if you were able to, because he, anyway, he'd recommended me to, to, uh, Linda, um, and, and so what happened was I got a phone call then from, from Linda saying, explaining the situation and, and, um, could I do an interview like this sort of on camera, um, and also she was going to fax me the script or rather email me the script and, the, and then they'd somehow they'd audition me over the over the Skype and that's what I did I, I, I got a page of script uh, I think it might have been um, the hologram scene I'm pretty sure it was and um, I did it she gave me a few kind of notes and um, and what, uh, anyway, and, and then at the end of it, what I remember, she said, I think that's good enough. I'll show it to Doug, and I, but I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> it, was all, it was incredibly straightforward and simple. And, um, and the next thing I knew, I'd been offered it. Then, when the uh, script came through and the contract, yes, there were all sorts of uh, conditions attached. You know, you had to be, uh, you know, incredibly discreet about every element. You weren't allowed to discuss it on social media you weren't allowed to talk about it almost to your partner or spouse you know um, it was very very tightly controlled um, and you know and even to the extent in the actors directory spotlight you weren't allowed to give the character name uh, when you put your credit on the spotlight until the episode had gone out and of course there was about almost a year from the recording to when it was transmitted. So all, all one could say was one was involved. I think you could say you were involved with Red Dwarf, but cast member or something, but you couldn't say lecturer Rimmer until it had gone out. Do you think real you would get on with Rimmer or would you choose another shipmate? I don't think I'd get on at all with Rimmer. It's very obvious I wouldn't. 
Would I choose another shipmate? Of course I would. I don't know who. Um, so that's that's all I can say, really. I think I'd be. I think lecture room would be absolutely impossible as um, as a as a shipmate or as a crew member on Red Dwarf. Uh, in fact, I, I could sort of envision envision him uh, commanding a different ship and um, dealing with his son or not son through laser beams and cannons and things, almost like a pirate. That <laughs> shows how much I know. Anyway, thank you very much, Posse. Thank you very much. Excuse my eye, by the way. I've got an infection on my eye. Um, thank you very much, Mark. And and uh, all the best to everyone involved with Red Dwarf. And I hope, I hope I'll have a chance to see you all again. Bye-bye.